the Lindbergh Line. Lindbergh was a Chicago-based company that eventually moved to Skokie, Illinois. In 1933, Paul W. Lindbergh began creating plans for flying model aircraft. These were stick and tissue models that took a great deal of skill to construct and operate. Some of his planes appeared in popular aviation magazine. The magazine wrote articles with a list of materials and instructions on how to construct these flying aircraft. It also advertised them for sale. By 1935, Lindbergh had his own kits for sale. After World War II, Lindbergh went into business with a company called Olson to make their first molded plastic airplane kits under a name that included the beginning of each of their names. Olson Lindbergh was reduced to Olin. The first plastic kit was a P-80B Shooting Star, which is still in the Lindbergh lineup as the F-80C. The P-80 was packed in a very plain cardstock sleeve type box, like most of the Balsa kits of the time, with only green lettering on it. One thing that set Olin apart from companies like Hawk and Varney was that they used polystyrene, not acetate plastic, this would later become the industry standard. Unlike modern kits, it had no clear parts. Unfortunately, the Olin kit was met with the same lack of marketing interest as other companies' plastic kits, and sales were poor initially. Somewhere around 1948 or 49, Olin was able to buy molds from some of its competitors, including Empire's mold for the 148 scale Stenson and Varney's airplane molds, as they wanted to focus on trains. Olin replaced the X Barney items wooden parts with molded and vacuform plastic ones like the hulls of the PT boats in the LST. Olin also added the Piper Cub, Republic CB, and six small racers at the time. Sales were still lagging as hoppy shops did not really care for the plastic kits. They didn't fly and were seen by many people as little more than toys. Then in the summer of 1951, Ravel's highway pioneers were picked up by Woolworth's department store. Once plastic models were being sold in department stores and any other kind of stores that wanted to free up a little shelf space for them, the situation changed. Now the hobby shops had to take note, as everything from five and dime stores to pharmacies and department stores were making a little extra money selling plastic models. A survey in Boys Life magazine in the 50s found that four out of five boys who responded listed plastic model building as a hobby. Once plastic kits were marketed in a few mainstream stores, they began to sell very well, and to people other than hardcore stick and tissue builders. Now the companies needed to grab the buyer's attention. They needed visual shelf appeal. This led to ever more incredible box art. People like Ray Gradecki, and I apologize if I'm saying that wrong, were the first to join the new world of model box artwork. Ray had done full color work for Olin before. His contribution to the Lindbergh line box art was, well, prolific to say the least. Ray had been an artist before World War II, and when he went in the army, they used him to make cartoons for training manuals, as well as some more serious art, such as this self-portrait. By the 1950s, Olson was out of the picture and the company was renamed Lindbergh. The main subjects of the kits were vintage and modern aircraft, military vehicles, passenger airliners, and ships. And in 1955, he even introduced a somewhat whimsical UFO. Well, whimsical by today's standards. In the late 50s, Cellovision was introduced as a packaging innovation. Large cellophane windows allowed customers to see the molded plastic parts inside the packages, but it didn't really help the sales, so it was pretty short-lived. Some flying models managed to remain available well into the 50s, with the last of these being made of vacuform styrene. Gordon Varney was a speaker at a hobby trade convention in 1953, where he said that anyone who did not jump aboard the hobby bandwagon would be left in the dust. Lindbergh had no intentions of eating anyone's dust, and by 1955, their catalog had a wide variety of kits ranging from planes and ships to many types of cars, and the brand was still expanding. In the 1960s, Lindbergh introduced both HO model trains and 124 scale automotive kits, including then many modern hot rods. Most of these kits included electric motors, which takes us to our next issue. These were kit motors that came unassembled, which proved difficult for both novice and experienced alike. 
These motors were put in many of their kits for years to come, but it was rare to find someone who could get one to work. These were the parts and the instructions, and I only ever got one of them to work, and then not very well. About now, the 132nd scale hot rods and 18th scale Ford Roadster hot rod and dragsters also appeared. The Ford would be reissued in many versions over the following years. They were actually very nice kits. A brief entry into slot car racing was tried, but Lindbergh had the same poor results everyone else had, so it was pretty short-lived. In the 60s, the Mini Lindy series included plastic cars and trucks in 164 scale. In the 1970s, Lindbergh acquired tooling from a New York company, Palmer Scale Models. This line was an attempt to compete with AMT and MPC. Later in the 70s, another company, Pyro, got out of the business and Lindbergh acquired their tooling. Amongst Pyro's many toolings were molds for dinosaurs. Some new Lindbergh kits also appeared, including 132nd scale kits of then-current cars. The following decade would see mainly reissues of existing kits, including those produced previously by Pyro and Palmer. By the mid-1970s, Lindbergh kits were also being made in Venezuela, and this continued until the late 90s. In 1979, Lindbergh Products, which had moved to Skokie, Illinois, got a little bit into politics in a way. In 1977-78, a group of self-anointed American Nazis wanted to hold a march in the town of Skokie, Illinois. The town was picked largely because many residents were Holocaust survivors. As a response to this, Lindbergh joined a national campaign to put an end to the production of toys carrying Nazi symbols. This is when many kit makers quit putting swastikas on the decal sheets of World War II era German kits, although some had stopped doing it long before. Paul Lindbergh and the Lindbergh line are somewhat enigmatic. They've been very hard to research. I have not been able to find out when Paul Lindbergh retired or passed away. But I do know that with the introduction of video games in the late 1970s, models began to decline in popularity. By 1989, Craft House of Toledo, Ohio had acquired Lindbergh. George Toteff, a former executive with several model companies including AMT, MPC, and Lionel, assumed leadership. Under his management, Lindbergh introduced some new kits to include then-modern cars and pickup trucks in 1 to 20th scale. In 1996, they introduced 125 scale cars, the first of which was a 1964 Dodge. With these fully detailed car kits, Lindbergh sported a product that was on par with the competition. The first version of the Dodge, Color Me Gone, was no doubt selected because it was owned by the late Dick Branster, who was Toteff's longtime friend and occasional business partner. Lindbergh's automotive subject matter consisted of cars from the 50s, and 60s, as well as a current Ford Crown Victoria police car, while reissues of older items also continued. Lindbergh also put out a 1934 Ford pickup, which was actually the former AMT kit. Apparently, there's a bit of a story behind this. AMT sent the molds to a tooling shop to be repaired, but their parent company, Ertl, decided it wasn't worth the cost. The toolings were then acquired from the shop by Lindbergh, who did put the model back into production. Other toolings were also acquired, including the remains of IMC, or the Industro Motive Corporation, which had at one point been owned by testers. Lindbergh continued to expand their catalog, including in 1995, when they released a 7.5 inch tall, 12 inch long Godzilla, made from their own new molds. After the turn of the century, Lindbergh offered several versions of a tester's kit, the 1 to 24 scale Dodge Charger in their own packaging and later also offered it in several police versions. Other new tooling included a series of mid 30s Ford based designs, again, first produced for testers, then offered under the Lindbergh name. In 2006, Lindbergh was obtained by J. Lloyd International, who had also acquired Hawk. They tried to introduce some large-scale format kits, such as a 1-200 to scale Graf Zeppelin aircraft carrier, but they never made it into production. On the 1st of February 2011, George Todiff, who had been an executive AMT, MPC, Lionel, and Lindbergh, passed away. Finally, on March 18, 2013, 
Round 2 announced the acquisition of both Lindbergh and Hawk models from J. Lloyd International, and they're still making them today. Throughout its over eight-decade existence, the Lindbergh line has made models in pretty much every common scale, as well as some fairly oddball ones. These include 2 to 1 scale, 1 to 1 scale, 1 to 8 scale, 1 to 12 scale, 1 to 16 scale, 1 to 19 scale, 1 to 20 scale, 1 to 22 scale, 1 to 24 scale, 1 to 25 scale, 1 to 35 scale, 1 to 38 scale, 1 to 64 scale, 1 to 87 scale, or HO, 1 to 96 scale, 1 to 125 scale, which makes sense for larger ship models, 1 to 144 scale, 1 to 200 scale, and of course, 1 to 245th scale. Although they mostly produce just modern copies of the old kits, they have also put out some oddball stuff in the past, so you never know what the future holds for the Lindbergh line. <laughs>